controversial plan. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill question a proposal for the IRS to monitor bank deposits. Budget bill setback. Why President Joe Biden may have trouble raising corporate taxes. Campaign for governor. The two top candidates vie for votes in Virginia. And zest for life. We have a new report on Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, October 21st, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. As the Biden administration proposes a policy aimed at reducing the tax gap, Republicans say that they don't want the government spying on the bank accounts of middle Americans and small businesses. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Despite media reports that the Biden administration is backing away from directing the IRS to collect information on America's bank accounts that make transactions more than $600, Republicans say that that's misleading because the way the bill is currently written, the Treasury Secretary can investigate any account it wants. The Secretary, meaning the Secretary of Treasury, will be given broad authority to issue regulations necessary to implement this proposal, which says that the IRS will be given broad rulemaking authority to get the data it wants. I asked House GOP leader Kevin McCarthy about this. He backed up Senator Mike Crapo's analysis. Any American who makes more than $29 a day or spends $29 a day, you are a target. And that's the majority of Americans. Senator Mike Crapo is a lead Republican on the Finance Committee. He says the language in the bill is vague. He did offer a simple solution. Why don't they just put a ban in there that bans the IRS from snooping in the accounts of people who make less than $400,000. That's a question I think that should be asked of the sponsors of this approach. Republicans say arming the IRS with more than 2,500 new agents is a tactic to force Americans to pay for President Biden's economic agenda. But Democrats claim they're just going after the wealthy tax cheats. An IRS official recently testified in the uh, Senate Banking know, Committee. The top 1% of earners in America underpay their taxes by more than $150 billion each year, almost $2 trillion over the course of 10 years. More than $150 billion a year is lost by these top earners. Details are still being worked out, but Speaker Nancy Pelosi says hiring new IRS agents will be in the reconciliation bill. Yes, there are concerns that some people have, but if people are breaking the law and not paying their taxes, one way to track them is through the banking measure. Democrats hope to have a framework for the spending bill by the end of the month. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. A going after billionaires tonight. The White House is considering a new way to pay for Build Back Better. President Joe Biden claims that his proposal would be paid for without adding a dime to the national debt, but opponents are doubtful. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. President Biden's multi-trillion dollar economic agenda was supposed to include a tax hike on corporations, but now it appears that may be off the table. Instead, on the table, a new billionaire's tax on investment gains. President Joe Biden will take part in a town hall tonight in Baltimore trying to convince Americans once again his Build Back Better agenda and bipartisan infrastructure deals are urgently needed for the country. Tweeting this morning in Maryland alone, my agenda will invest at least $4.1 billion for federal aid highways and $409 million for bridges, plus $1.7 billion to improve public transportation options in the state. Right now, the Democrats are divided. There's internal fighting. The original price tag for Build Back Better, $3.5 trillion, now down to around $2 trillion. And things like the child tax credit and paid family leave, pared down. But opponents, like the Heritage Foundation, write, the Build Back Better Act includes trillions in tax increases, and the official scorekeepers confirm that taxes will go up for middle-income Americans earning $30,000 or more per year. America. Meanwhile, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the dedication of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, Washington Cardinal Wilton Gregory offered this encouragement. We cannot afford to grow weary. As the life example of Dr. King shows us, we must stay united and strengthened 
by our nation's commitment as we walk with one another for the benefit and good of all. Later, President Biden also honored Dr. King's legacy. Dr. King said, of all the forms of inequity, injustice in health care is the most shocking and most inhumane. Meanwhile, watching and critiquing this administration's every move, former President Donald Trump. As you know, he was booted off of Twitter and Facebook several months ago. Now he's launching a new media company with its own social media platform. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Less than two weeks out from the election, the high-profile Virginia governor's race appears to be neck and neck. A Monmouth University survey shows voters are split 46 to 46 percent over Democrat Terry McAuliffe and Republican Glenn Youngkin. State President Joe Biden carried in the 2020 presidential election. Joining me now is Vince Colonnais, editorial director for The Daily Caller. Vince, welcome back. Always great to see you. I uh, want to talk about the Virginia governor's race. It's really getting a lot of attention right now. And it seems that Democrats are pretty concerned about voter enthusiasm. What do you think is the mood among voters in Virginia? I think it's both disinterest and disappointment uh, among Democrats right now in Virginia, which bodes very poorly for the former governor of the Commonwealth, uh, which is Terry McAuliffe. He is running now again to return uh, to the governor's house, and his chances, they look like a coin toss at this moment. His opponent, Glenn Youngkin, has uh, pretty successfully attracted a coalition of some enthusiastic voters, Republicans, and even some Democrats, and definitely some independents in Virginia. And a lot of the issues really are about uh, a couple things, but I say the two primary issues are education and the issue of abortion. Now, Glenn Youngkin, the Republican, is running very strongly on this issue of education. You know, Terry McAuliffe a couple weeks ago in a debate said that parents should have no role in telling schools what their kids should be taught. That is just a tragic mistake to make in a political environment. And Glenn Youngkin has made sure voters hear that quote all the time. Meanwhile, Terry McAuliffe is claiming that Glenn Youngkin is seeking to ban abortion entirely in Virginia. That is not Youngkin's position, although he is pro-life. Uh, but Terry McAuliffe thinks that making seem, uh, making Youngkin seem like he's going to aggressively pursue getting rid of abortion in the state is a winning formula for him. So he's been trying to rely on that. Uh, and uh, that's where we are right now. Right now, a neck and neck race in Virginia. Yeah, and I was just going to say that, Vince, uh, some polling that came out yesterday, I mean, they literally are tied in this race. And this is being considered really a bellwether election. Let's talk a little bit more about that. It is absolutely. And the reason why I think it's safe to consider this one a bellwether election is because uh, Terry McAuliffe feels like that. Uh, if you listen to the rhetoric he's been using on the campaign trail of late, he's been complaining that uh, Democrats in Washington are not getting their legislative agenda passed. And then as a result, it's weighing him down. Now, I would argue that Terry McAuliffe is, is not a very good candidate anyway. And so his problems are mostly of his own making. But insofar as Republicans, especially in Virginia, are energized, part of their energy does actually come from the failures of the Biden administration. So as you're watching, as Joe Biden's numbers are absolutely plummeting, I mean, just, he is he is falling to new record lows in polling every day now. A uh, big Monmouth University poll out this week that demonstrated he is just not polling well. He's especially um, turning off independents who are turning against him in rapid numbers. That's going to have an impact in Virginia. And Terry McAuliffe um, is going to have to bear the cost of Joe Biden's failures, especially if Terry McAuliffe ends up losing this race. Yeah, Vince, I want to take, before we wrap up, a look at the country kind of overall. Uh, we're seeing a number of Democratic lawmakers announce their retirement ahead of the midterm elections. Um, do you think the U.S. House of Representatives may flip? And what do you think is spurring these retirements? I, I think it's very likely it's going to flip. I mean, right now, within just the Democratic Party, there is gridlock uh, over what the agenda should be and how far left to take the country. And it's disenchanting some of the members, and they are announcing their retirements. They're they're leaving. I, I think at this point the House is if, if if the election were today, Republicans would very easily take the House and perhaps the Senate. Uh, so I think right now the party with headwinds is the party in power. Democrats um, again 
owing to the fact that so much in the country is out of control right now, and voters blame the people who are in power, Democrats controlling the White House, the Senate by the slimmest of margins, and the House by a very slim margin, they're getting blamed uh, because they're, they're failing the American people. And so we could see, um, I think, a real change in, in one or both houses next year in those 2022 midterms. Well, Vince, thank you so much for coming. I always appreciate your analysis. Vince Colonna is editorial director of The Daily Caller. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. A former major college football coach says his firing earlier this week was an attack on his Catholic faith. Nick Rolovich and four assistants were fired by Washington State University after they refused to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Rolovich says that his request for a religious exemption to the governor's vaccine mandate was denied. He also says that he is planning to take legal action. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI is full of zest for life, says his personal secretary. A letter from the Pope Emeritus had expressed fraternal grief for the recent death of Father Gerhard Winkler, a dear friend and former colleague. Benedict's secretary says its sentiment to join friends who have passed was not morbid, but rather lovingly intended. He adds Benedict is crystal clear in his head and has his typical Bavarian humor. That for more details about this story and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, see the story at catholicnewsagency.com. El Salvador's Congress has again upheld its total ban on abortion. The vote was 73 to 11 to retain the country's right to life constitutional article, which was approved back in 1998. It marks the third unsuccessful challenge to undermine El Salvador's pro-life law. Flash floods and landslides in northern India and Nepal have claimed nearly 200 lives. <laughs> Death tolls are likely to rise as thousands of rescue workers search for the missing. Regional mountains in the neighboring countries have received unrelenting rains for the past three days. Rivers are overflowing, washing away roads, bridges, railways, and even homes. Coming up, UK attack update. Police nab a suspect accused of killing a pro-life politician diplomatic duo, how the Vatican and Serbia are recognizing their relationship. British police announced charges in last week's slaying of Sir David Amos. Ali Harby Ali, aged 25 and from North London, has been charged with murder and the preparation of terrorist acts contrary to Section 5 of the Terrorism Act 2006. A Conservative in Parliament and a Catholic, Amos was meeting with constituents at a church when he was killed. An exhibition this week in Rome is celebrating the 100th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the Vatican and Serbia. The exhibit opened earlier this week, and it includes a number of documents that have never been placed on public display. They reveal the diplomatic relations that existed between Serbia and the Vatican from 1878 until the start of World War I. The Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenians established ties with the Holy See in 1920. Joining us now from Rome is Sima Avramovic, ambassador from the Republic of Serbia to the Holy See. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your time today. Uh, we appreciate it. Can you tell us more about this exhibit? What sorts of documents are on display there? Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit about this exhibition, which was opened in Belgrade about 10 days ago. And we had a few days ago a twin exhibition here in Rome at the University Lateranensis. It's a very prestigious place in the academic sense, but also part of the uh, Vatican uh, University space. Uh, the exhibition is important both for public in Serbia and for the public here, or even wider in the world. For Serbian people, it is very important to see that the relationships with Washington, sorry, <laughs> with Vatican are really very, very old. And I think that the most important message is that the most representative people 
of Serbian intellectual elites, uh, statesmen, you professors of the university, politicians were very fond of establishing the relationship with Vatican among the uh, first countries by the end of the 19th century. What is not very well known is that in that time Washington did uh, sorry, Vatican didn't have a lot of uh, treaties and conquered that. So Serbia and Washington made one of those very important first steps in their relationship by the beginning of the 19th century. It was particularly by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, crowned by the acceptance of the Concordate in 1914, just a few days before the First World War started. And I'd like to switch gears slightly here. Uh, would you mind giving us an update on how the Catholic Church is doing in your country? I understand that Serbia is majority Orthodox and only around 5 percent Catholic. You're right. Serbia was always with uh, Orthodox majority, including the very beginning of the country in 1835. So even then, when Serbia got rid a little bit of the Turkish occupation, in the first constitution of 1835, there was a very interesting uh, norm in the constitution which gave a full freedom of religion and right to worship to all different kind of denominations. Uh, in that time, in Europe, they said that it was a French tra transplant in a Turkish forest, because this idea of freedom of religion was a constant line starting when, with 1835, until next constitutions, which came years and decades later. So it is the case also today but uh, in the modern Serbian legal system, we have seven traditional religions. We call it traditional religions. And of course, uh, Orthodox, Catholics, Muslim, uh, two, two, two kinds of Protestants, Jews are within those seven. And they have completely equal rights in all spheres, starting with the teaching of religion, uh, privileges in the tax system, and all other, other possibilities, the same as the majority religion of Orthodox. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time today and speaking with us. We appreciate it, Sima Avramovich, Ambassador for the Republic of Serbia to the Holy See. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Up next, coming home, former Anglicans joined the Catholic Church. Tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, the founder and chair of the U.S. Senate Pro-Life Caucus, Senator Steve Daines, reacts to the nine appropriations bills introduced by Senate Democrats. Now with President Biden in office, we've said we will not allow any appropriation bills that remove high protection, the law of the land, for 45 years. It's wrong. Senator Daines says that there is enough senators willing to stand up for life and deny any appropriations that remove high protection. See more tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly at 10 p.m. Eastern. Well, as we reported earlier this week, the former head of the Anglican Diocese of Rochester, England, was recently received into the Catholic Church. Bishop Michael Nazir Ali was once a contender to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. He is the most recent former Anglican leader to become Catholic. And joining us now to discuss this and more is Dr. Gavin Ashton, a recent Catholic convert and the former chaplain to Queen Elizabeth II. Dr. Ashton, thank you so much for your time today. Great to be with you. Uh, first off, I, I want to quickly talk to you about Queen Elizabeth, to whom you've had a very close relationship. Uh, as you know, just this week, her doctors instructed her to take a break from public appearances for a while. What do you know any more about that, if anything? And what was your reaction when you heard the news? Well, her private medical information is kept very private, and people uh, outside the immediate household only know what the rest of us are told. Her, her health is, of course, amazing. For a woman her age, it's extraordinary that she's so robust and energetic 
and, and intellectually and emotionally astute. So um, we continue to hope that rather like her mother, she goes on and lives for some considerable time. Uh, she is enormously loved and she provides the glue that gives an, an identity to the whole of our of our, our national aspiration. So she matters very much to many people. And I also understand that you know Bishop uh, Nazir Ali personally as well. Uh, can you tell us about his journey and how maybe you've been able to help him along the way when it comes to converting to Catholicism? Yes, Bishop Michael and I had, had dinner about a year and a half ago as we looked at the task that we thought lay ahead of us, which was to see if we could keep Anglicanism faithful to its own identity, uh, to the traditions of the church and to the Bible. Uh, and the, the, the problem that Anglicanism faces is that it, it has no magisterium. It doesn't have any common mind about how we interpret the Bible and apply them to the, many of the ethical issues that we face today. So we both had different responsibilities. Um, and in my case, it was about uh, a year and a half ago when I was asked to to join my local Catholic bishop and to convert. And I, I did with joy because by that time I discovered that everything we were trying to do with Anglicanism couldn't be done. Uh, bishop Michael uh, took a little longer and he made his decision only recently. And I must say, I'm, I'm extremely glad because I thought it uh, authenticated my own judgment as I hope my judgment authenticates his. So it's very encouraging we find ourselves uh, in, on parallel paths having made the same analysis of the present very difficult situation. Yeah, and, and what I find interesting, it seems that neither you nor Bishop Nazir Ali are the first prominent Anglicans to actually convert to Catholicism recently. What do you think it is, um, if you can talk about this a little bit more, that draws those to the Catholic faith? And do you think that we may see more prom prominent Anglicans and, and Anglicans in general converting? I think it's probably fair to say that Anglicanism is a kind of an experiment. It's, a, it's an ecumenical experiment that began 500 years ago. Uh, and it was an attempt to make a, build a bridge between some of the more enthusiastic reformers and the Catholic Church that we all grew out of. It was never certain that that bridge was going to hold. But certainly as the secular uh, end of the bridge has begun to move further and further away from the Christian church. Certainly in England, there's a point at which uh, the Anglican church has to say to the state, you're turning your backs on Christianity, you're turning your back on God, on Christian ethics, and you, and you need to come back. Um, the Anglican church hasn't been able to find the courage or the perception to do that. And so it's compromised itself with secular values, many of which are actually, frankly, anti-Christian. And so there are really only two ways to go. One is the Protestant end of the bridge, and the other is the Catholic end of the bridge. For those of us who always saw ourselves as growing out of Catholicism, uh, it seems to me to be something of a no-brainer to look and to see that uh, the only place safe as this chasm opens is on the Catholic side of the bridge. So um, many of us have made the journey back to the Mother Church and recognize that the, the, the uh, Erastian, the state experiment, that Anglicanism was, doesn't work anymore. Will there be other people? Yes, I think there were. There have been quite a large number already. Uh, certainly in England, 10% of present serving Roman Catholic clergy are ex-Anglicans. Um, I don't know how many more will come, but, I've, but, but Michael Nazi Ali is held in such high regard that I'd be very surprised if some considerable number didn't follow him after the publicity that, that is consequent on his decision. Well, Dr. Ashen, thank you so much for speaking with us and sharing all of that with us. Uh, we really do appreciate it. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.